You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And I'm certain I've been protected by a higher power my entire life. Because I've been shot and stabbed and I've had so many near-death experiences. Um, I feel kind of, I feel I've been protected. And um, whatever happens, will happen. My granddad was really poorly before I went in. <clears throat> My granddad was like a father to us. He raised us as his son, you know. Um, yeah, I miss him. And um, yeah, I miss him a lot. For what I've been put through by this person, as in two trips to prison and all the, everything else, all the psychological side that goes with it. And I mean, on the flip side, I've said some things about him, things that I believe to be true. But, you know, if you want to compare what we've put each other through, I definitely feel I've had the shit under the stick. For me, people say shit about me, people do videos about me. Mm -hmm. For me, a man, I sit in silence. I wait as well. I've Just noticed. because I've been silent doesn't mean I've fucking forgotten. Believe uh -huh. me, mate. Believe yeah. me. Like, uh -huh. And out of everybody, I'm the one you don't want responding to you. I'm mm -hmm. the one you don't want sending a video back because mm -hmm. I'll fucking destroy you. Still in the same breath, couldn't actually believe what I was hearing and what I was reading. And I got a lot of shit, you know, myself for the things I've done. But as well, I've never been exposed for anything, ever. You know, anything negative that's out there, I've put it out there myself. I locked eyes with him, got in there and locked eyes with him. He looked away. He looked away. And I knew then, then I had the edge, you know. I mean, I was supposed to get steamrolled, remember? But the weight difference, look at the credentials, you know what I mean? That fight was never meant to go that way, apparently to the public's opinion, but I knew that was the least I was going to do. And I wasn't really happy with the draw, but I took it for my own reasons. I feel need to be round here, Mush. Ben, we're on. Kushti. And today's guest, we've got fighting man, Danny Christie. How are you, brother? I'm good, mate. I'm good. Good, good. to see you. Thank you. Seen you all over the internet the last kind of few months and yeah. bare knuckle fight. I must, fair play, like total scrap. I must be honest, like mad fight, powerful fight. Yeah. But we'll touch on all that later on in the interview. First and foremost, how are you? I'm all right. Like I say, I'm getting there, you know, getting there. I'm going to be on struggles like everybody else, but getting there, starting to find a little bit of peace, you know? Yeah, that's the main thing, a bit of content and yeah. that's all you want in life, isn't it? A bit of, your life has been a, a bit of a mad journey, which we'll touch on. How's a little? I always like to go back to the start for my guests. Where you grew up and how it all began? Hi, mate. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Grew up uh, just a mile down the road, Curragh. Curragh Estate. Uh, always have a place in my heart, you know, it's just a place I've loved. Still love it now. I'm actually moving back there, next chance I get over the next couple of weeks. Moving back there, um, uh, it's always home, you know, over there. And uh, things was all right. Never had a bad upbringing, you know. I mentioned on another podcast, this, you know, similar stuff, you know, similar things. And, and you know, I think I had a bit of trauma without noticing. You know, if, if that makes any sense, I had a definitely a big void with not having a dad about. And um, you know, at the time, you know, you, you just you just get on with it, don't you? Things were all right. Things always seemed all right. But looking back, there was definitely. A bit of instability there, you know, there wasn't a, wasn't as stable as it should have been or could have been, you know, but definitely no complaints. What were you like at school? Little shit. Well, yeah. Yeah. I can see that, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was cheeky, mate. I was like world champion at giving grief, you know. Yeah. World champion, mate. Is that because you never had the father figure as well, though, that you kind of always had to stick up for yourself? Perhaps, mate. I took a lot of kickings in that at school. Got pushed about a bit at school, actually. And I never, uh, I never sort of realised... Even though I was boxing from 11, I certainly never had the balls to, to engage with anybody physically till I was about 16, 17. And uh, sort of set about a few lads that give us some shit shortly after I left school, gives us a hard time at school. And I set about them and thought, you know, you know I, can, I can do this, you know, I can, I can actually handle myself a little bit. And went in the wrong direction, you know, and with, with that sort of confidence. Is that why you went to boxing at such a young age? Um. I can never remember what drew me to the boxing. I remember walking in the gym when I was 11 and uh, my first spar I had, got my nose popped and I went home and cried. 
and uh, I thought this isn't for me, you know. But I was meant to go back down. A few, few of the older lads who looked, kept an eye on us and that, some good lads. <clears throat> they were, <clears throat> excuse me, they were going down at the time. They used to train, they used to compete. And they kind of, you know, kind of almost pushed us back into it. And I'm glad they did because, you know, slowly started getting better and better. Confidence got better. And, you know, it's a brilliant thing, boxing. I would advise any kids, you know, or any, any parents, you know, to try and get the kids into boxing because good structure, good discipline. And uh, to me, it only seems like there's the occasional wanker that's in boxing. You know what I mean? People, in my, in my opinion, boxers are usually pretty good guys. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, they try to take liberties. I was the same. I used to train and do a bit of Muay Thai in the grip house in Glasgow. And uh -huh. you look at these kids and you would think nothing of them. Mm -hmm. Just nice, humble guys just standing there doing their thing, training hard. Yeah. And you wouldn't think they were stone cold killers. Like, even no. if you give them shit on the street, they still would walk away. Absolutely, aye. Yeah, and that's what it's all about, I think. Mm -hmm. It's the ones who retaliate and, and act as the ones we feel as if we've got something to prove. Yeah. The ones who can properly have a tear up and stone, like Even the guys, I've interviewed a lot of guys for the SAS. Yeah. And you would not know. You would mm -hmm. think, who's that old wanker? Really unassuming. Just tie you up, mate, in two seconds, Tell mate, you. before you know it, you're in a, a pretzel. Like a pretzel bro. <laughs> <laughs> yes, mate. Did you feel that was a big part of your mental health as a young kid doing the boxing? Did that help a lot? Uh, I think so. Looking back, it did. It certainly took up a lot of my time. Um, Especially once I started getting better and better, I got to a decent level in the amateurs. I competed in the nationals a few times. I got to the quarters, which was a good standard, you know, from kids from that club. You know, it was a small club, limited funding and that. But uh, we always seemed to do well. Some good fighters. We seemed to go pretty far for the size of the club that it was. You know, we obviously had to compete with big clubs from Liverpool, Manchester, and these clubs are getting a lot of funding. They're getting brilliant coaching, and I think we're doing all right with them. You know, did you have a big family? No. No, me, uh, my dad come up from Burnley in the eighties, early eighties, with my uncle Sean. They were told by a court that you know that they had to get out of Burnley. The pair of them, they had to be, the pair of them had to be somebody else's problem. They were told by a judge. So, a lot of barstools and that they come up on their own, and, and I never had a big family. And the majority of my family's in Burnley. What's left of them? Up here, I've just got my mum and my brother that's left. Obviously, my own kids, but above me, it's just my mum, my brother. Did you have work, job? When you were a young kid? Oh, I was uh, grafting a paper round from when I was 11 and went on to the milk. And uh, I was left, as soon as I left uh, school at 16, I was right on fitting carpets in the biscuit factory. And I've never really not worked. Always been a grafter? Aye. What was your first proper tear up? In the street? Yeah. Um, I won't mention his name, I think he knows who he is. Uh, started swapping shots outside the school once when I was. It was to finish school, and it was out between the two schools on the main road. And I started swapping shots with him, and uh, I had pulled myself off. I pulled myself off the floor a few times, and I uh, don't think I won the fight, but certainly got the respect of a few of the older lads for that. Because I've seen a few of your videos, it's like you never want confrontation. You don't want to fight, but then when you do, you seem to fucking enjoy it. Aye, yeah, I don't I know. I do, you know, and for, for, I do enjoy fighting for the right reasons, you know. Do you get a good buzz from it? There's no buzz like it, mate. You never feel more alive. What about, because I know you've been in prison, which we'll touch on later in the interview, but have you been in, out of prison your whole life? No. No, I never went to prison until I was 34. 34. I think I, no, 35, I think I first went. First went 35 with the, the situation, you know, the situation on the internet. Um, first went there, I was remanded for 11 weeks. That was a nightmare because... Remand's a nightmare, mate. You don't know what's going on, mm -hmm. especially with the kids and that. And like I said to people before, prison for me wasn't the place itself, and there's nothing hard about it. It wasn't I mean, locked up. It's not nice, but it's, man, missing my kids, mate. That was a nightmare. You know what I mean? Especially speaking to them on the phone, you get this highlight, this buzz, of speaking to them on the phone, and this buzz of seeing them. And then when you go, you were ten times lower than you were before you seen them. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it's kind of been given to you and taken away. Just the height, everything was just the height of frustration in there for me. But um, the place itself is like a community centre, you know what I mean? It's a lot of rats in there, obviously, but I never, you know, can see how it doesn't work, you know what I mean? See how the system doesn't work, especially if you're a young lad without kids, you know what I mean? And your business is criminality. It's just an occupational hazard, you know, I can't see it deterring many people, you know? To be honest. Yeah, not many people change when they come out of prison. No. It's a high percentage of the people 
re-offend uh, re-offend mate and that, that's sad because everybody's got something man everybody can do something productive like, yeah. I've had people on that spent 20 30 years in prison and came out and changed their life like it does happen but only a small majority of people really want it and if you come from broken homes or you're so far in the system from such a young age you don't see any difference anything in life yes that was your first taste of prison life I first test there, I was done 11 week and um, my granddad was really poorly before I went in. <clears throat> my granddad was like a father to us. He raised us as his son, you know. Um, yeah, I miss him. And um, yeah, I miss him a lot. And he uh, he raised us as his son and he was he was poorly, really poorly when I went to prison. I'd actually made up with him, had a bit of a fallout with my granddad over things that I'd done to my mum, you know, I had a kick off with my mum one day and, you know, put my hands on her. You know, I've spoke about that and I'm not proud of it at all, but it happened, you know, and uh, my granddad rightly so fell out with us and that was a knife to the heart. I'd never been so distraught, you know, I was the only person I ever, me and my mum's got a brilliant relationship now and we've always had a kind of on-off relationship, but I was never scared of disappointing the woman, you know, I don't, just, just a plain simple truth, you know, I was never, never afraid of disappointing her, you know, I just, but my granddad was completely different to uh, different kettle of fish with him I, I was his blue-eyed boy and you know it was hard you know and it was completely my own fault and completely my own doing and um you know I had to live with that him falling out with us and she so was poorly before really poorly before I went to prison but he invited us round me and my mum made up um which I was so grateful for and um he invited us round my granddad and I spoke to him and we were on good terms before I went to prison but um uh, I don't know what the what the notice is or what what it's called, but he was kind of given so long to live. Couple, he was, he was given a week to live by the doctor. So during which time, me, me legal rep and that he applied for this conditional, what was it, uh, bail basically, and it was compassionate bail with immediate release, given the circumstances. Uh, and to get out and see my granda, and I was never been so grateful in my life at that point to get out and go and see him because I knew how time was of the essence with him and I got out that you know the, obviously job number one I got out and immediately went to see him I held his hand to his bedside and he, he couldn't open his eyes <clears throat> and um, he said some of the nicest words I can't remember and um, that was nice I was so grateful to uh, to have that chance you know to to hold his hand and for him to say the things he said to us um, will resonate in me forever and um Within an hour, he was dead, and that was difficult, you know. And um, but I have to be—I have to be, you know, just so grateful that I got that opportunity. You know what I mean? To hold his hand in his dying hour, and for him to say the things he said to us uh, it was really, really powerful. Huh? Yeah, could you imagine if you were locked up and you never got to see that? You live with that pain. I actually, your life. I actually can't, mate. But I'm so glad it never happened that mm -hmm. way. Yeah, but at least you got to say uh, final words, which is the main thing. And um, yeah. It's a, that's the only thing you, if you do bad in life and you get, it's your family you took away and that's the things you regret. But like I say, mate, you got to meet them, which is something that yeah. probably kept you alive. Absolutely. And it's like sometimes, regardless of what you're going through, <clears throat> I think, um, you, know, you know, sometimes you, you swim through a river of shit, don't you? And just to get that little tiny bit of relief at the end, you know, and feels worth it. You know, no matter what you've been through, it felt worth it, you know, because, um, you know, it's a funny thing the way things work out and become more and more of the opinion that things do happen for a reason. And I would once upon, you know, dismissed things as coincidence or, or just ignorant to the, you know, the situation. And, uh, you know, I think it seems like that happened for a reason and, I'm, like I say, grateful. I can't be any more grateful. I've never been any more grateful for anything, you know, to get that chance to, to speak to that man and uh, and tell him how I felt and tell him, you know, just to wholeheartedly apologise to him. And he just shut me down. He said, forget about all that, you know. I've got something to tell you. And it was powerful, you know. Mm -hmm. All the stuff that's been on the internet recently with your bare knuckle match and there's been a lot of back and forth, a lot of mud that's slinging to each other for years. Like the other man from Carlisle, like, how did that start? <clears throat> um, the mental health thing I had a big problem with. Uh, I've never openly spoke about my own mental health, but 
No, I've got my own twists and that, and a few dark places myself. And I have kids who suffer from legitimate mental health problems. And um, cause there was a lot of mental health videos flying about at the time by, you know, person. And uh, I just had a large problem with what I was watching with my own eyes. You know, these things, this this person, you know, I just and I just thought, and I was disgusted, to be honest, that this person was somehow a representation of people who weren't having a very good time, you know what I mean? And I was frankly just disgusted and I challenged them. I challenged the videos in a big, big way, you know, and I made a lot of noise and I was willing to, you know, physically engage. No, no, it was a fight I wanted immediately, just through, you know, a dislike for this individual and what he was trying to project, you know, and I just thought mental health, I mean, mental health is obviously a very serious issue indeed. And um, you know, for this person to be jumping on it, for, in my opinion, for all the wrong reasons, you know, jumping on it for personal gain is what I've seen, you know, and parading disabled kids about, you know, making videos of them, you know, I mean, for completely for his own gain. And then, you know, I got, a, I got news that a certain individual he was helping, a certain individual he was making videos with, he'd returned them to the parents and, um, and tried to charge them a fee for, um, for the hours that they'd had them out. And at that point, I just, I had a lot of my own problems, of course, at the time, but no, I just channeled every th all this, you know, bad emotion, all this negativity that I had going on in my own life. I channeled it, you know, towards this issue, you know, and I made a lot of videos of a threatening, violent nature, which I'm not proud of. But it was what it was, you know, I had a big beam in my bonnet with what was going on, what was being said, and just the, the use of mental health, you know, to, uh, you know, for his own you know, gratification, whatever, for his own personal gain. You know, I had a big, big problem with that. And uh, I still do. You know, I think there's a lot of stuff on the internet at the minute. You've got a lot of the wrong people jumping on the right purpose for the wrong reasons, you know? It's the old, look at me helping this person. Well, yeah. it's bollocks, in it? I mean... Yeah, a lot of people, and the thing about YouTube, a lot of people think it's a judge and jury and, and everything that's on there is truth as well. Like, you've got to question everything from every angle. Of course you have. Just it's only people's opinions. That's all it is. But there's never any smoke without fire. So mm. there's always going to be question marks over every single person who's got a voice. People are always going to defend themselves and, and attack back, which is rightly so as well. Everybody's got a, a chance to defend themselves as well. But course, yeah. for YouTube, it's a weird, weird place. But for yourself in that situation, it seems to be never ending. It seems to be it's been on for years. Like, was there ever going to be any closure with this situation? Yeah, for me. I mean, I, th I didn't see it, but I thought the fight would have put some closure on it, you know, for me. <clears throat> I remember coming home with Paul after the fight and I remember feeling this, like, a, an, un you know, like an unburden and I felt like, you know, like a, and a really liberating feeling of, like I've said it before, you know, I never really wanted to put hands on anybody as much as that person. And once I'd done that, I did feel a bit self, you know, self-satisfying. And even when I turned up to the fight and I knew, you know, I could see him over there, type of thing. And there was this sickly satisfying feeling in my gut. You know, I was just so aware. It was just, I mean, it was going down. And I was, I was buzzing, you know. But um, on the way home, I did feel this feeling of, you know, kind of gone, eh? You know, this hatred, if you like, had gone. But I realised it hadn't gone. You know, it'd just been diluted with a buzz, you know. And um it's been difficult for me lately. I mean I mean I'm not saying poor me or anything because there's always people worse in a worse position, but um you know, I don't want I don't want this no more, mate, you know. I don't want this chew no more. This talk of this happening again. March the nineteenth. Well, I'm game. But, uh, you know, I just think I need to say something now. That um, for what I've been put through by this person, as in two trips to prison and all the, everything else, all the psychological side that goes with it, 
And I mean, on the flip side, I've said some things about him, things that I believe to be true. But, you know, if you want to compare what we've put each other through, I definitely feel I've had the shit under the stick. But in the same breath, I forgive him. I forgive that person. Not for him, but for myself. Because I can't hold that level of hatred towards anybody, anybody anymore. I can't do it because, you know, it's holding me back. It's holding me back in, in what I want, the person I want to be. You know, it's, it's holding us back. It's held us back for years now. You know, I've just come to the realization that I don't need, I don't need to hate him. And I don't, I no longer want to hate him anymore. I'm more than happy to turn up on the 19th and bust his face open. But um, it'd be a lot more like a sporting event this time. And I think the hatred that I had towards him definitely hindered my performance because I'm a lot better fighter than that. You know, and uh, if anyone knows fighting, you know, they'll tell you, you go in there angry, you're going to get beat. Well, I went in there raging. And looking back at the fight, you know, I am a lot better fighter than that. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't capitalizing on any of my feints. I wasn't, and I was fighting him on a punch by punch basis. You know, I wasn't setting traps. I wasn't thinking ahead like I do, you know, and a bad guard, bad head movement, bad defense. But that's, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. But at the time, I was confident I was going to win. But looking back, emotion definitely hindered my performance in a big, big way. You know, so if this comes off, you know, you'll see a lot more professional approach, tactical approach, and, um, you know, I'll win hands down. Yeah, holding on to rage and anger towards somebody only consumes you as a person. It's yeah. difficult to, it's okay to forgive, but it's okay to forgive, but never forget. But exactly. holding on to rage and anger towards somebody is only going to consume you and take away whatever you can achieve in life because it's hard enough to change your own life when you're truly focused on yourself, never mind all the outside noise and exactly. half and other people. For me, people say shit about me, people do videos about me. Mm -hmm. For me, a man, I sit in silence. I wait as well. I'm Just noticed. because I've been silent doesn't mean I've fucking forgotten. Believe uh -huh. me, mate. Believe yeah. me. Like, uh -huh. And out of everybody, I'm the one you don't want responding to you. I'm mm -hmm. the one you don't want sending a video back. Because mm -hmm. I'll fucking destroy you, and, let, and that's just facts, bro. And that's yeah. my actions have speak loud. My actions have always spoken over the last few years. I don't get involved because, frankly, I'm too fucking big for it. Mm -hmm. Nobody's on my level. I agree. And, and I'll be cocky as fucking confident as fuck as I like because I work hard on everybody else. I've had over 250 guests on this podcast. 99% of the people speak very highly of me, and I will take that percentage all day long. And mm -hmm. it tells you something about me. It also tells you something about your own character. The thing I like about you, Danny, is. You own your misery, you own your pain and your fuck ups doesn't justify what you've done in life. No. Certainly not. But the fact that you go, do you know what? I've done things, I fucked up, I'm sorry. Like you, it's life. But if everybody just comes out and tells the truth, you actually get more respect and support because the thing about people in the UK, the majority of them see through bullshit. The majority mm. know what's real, what's right. We're a pretty what's savvy wrong. island, aren't we? You yeah, know? we've got a good fucking island. As much as we can come from, come from fucked up environments, mm -hmm. we're raised out of to smell bullshit yeah. and that's the thing about it so if you're not real and if you, everybody can pretend for three months six months a year the mask yeah. always truly slips for, for anybody but I'd like to think I've made a good account of myself over the last four years far from a saint many mistakes I have done many things I regret many things I'm ashamed of but yeah. I'm trying to rectify it I'm trying to produce a good life I'm trying to bring podcasts where people can understand and pick up some inspiration in that listen this is a business for me I'm here to make money I'm here to feed my family I've found an avenue where I can do that and I enjoy what I do it's just there's a lot of envy out there and that's understandable but for me I use that negativity as a positivity when they send me negativity I will absorb that with positivity because I know they're broken I know they're so fucked in the head yeah. so when I sit in silence a lot of these people are so warped in the head that they think oh that was easy it's beaten, not, yeah. I'm just sitting Aye. I'm waiting <clears throat> I take a little bit of that what you've just said, especially lately. Uh, I get a lot. Of, I still get a troll, trolls. You know, I still get a, I still get a lot of shit on the internet, and I can handle it. I can handle it all. But there was a time, you know, and especially two years ago when I was new. You got to remember, I've only had a Facebook. It was my first social media. It was two years ago. That's how new I am to it. So I was first getting a grief for abuse. I mean, I want to know where people live. I'm getting that boiling. You know what I mean? I'm screaming at my phone. I'm bouncing around the house, <clears throat> excuse me. But uh, like, you said, like you said, it just all consumed me. You know, it was all for the wrong reasons. And now 
I draw strength from it. You know, I draw strength from him. You know, if I want to reply, if I think it's something cocky to say, mate, I'll say it. But a lot of time I won't, you know, and I'll just, I draw strength from it. And believe, you know, like in the, especially the last 10 days or so, I've actually started praying for people, you know, that maybe don't deserve it or you know, maybe you say I shouldn't do, but, you know, I can't help it, you know. I just, uh, I, feel, I feel for them a bit, a little bit, you know. Once upon a time, I never. But I do know a little bit. I feel for them and I feel that, it must be quite sad for them, you know, to project this this sort of stuff, you know. And uh, yeah, there's definitely an element of I feel sorry for him, eh? Yeah, but that gives you a little bit of peace. Like it's hard, it's easy to respond, it's easy to retaliate, it's mm -hmm. easy to do all that stuff. Yeah. But how much it consumes you after that is, is so draining because then it never ends. Mm -hmm. It's hard when people are constantly trying to antagonise and call you out and do this and say things that are so untrue that. You think whatever, but they, when you start reacting, they start getting even more annoyed because yeah. they, they thrive on hatred, they thrive on negativity. And of course, they do. I, just people just need to look at actions and see who's who's right, who's who's in the right, who's in the wrong. People can make their own assumptions, but again, it doesn't make you a judge or a jury. Where True. it doesn't really mean fuck all. The first time you went to prison, what was that for? Was this through all the stuff that you were doing online? Yeah. Um. I was shocked that I ever even got to court, to be honest. I was shocked that I ever even got um, taken in by the police, just given the fact that the nature of the individual I was dealing with, you know, apparently he was, he was this and that, was you know? And um, no, he ended up going to the police because he didn't like being called names. And that was, at the time I drew strength from that, thinking, you know, this is a bad day. This is a bad day for this person. You know, I'm still of the opinion that he doesn't know what a bad day is. I'm of, the, I'm of that opinion, but, you know, I thought this is a bad day for him, you know, somebody calling him names, you know, and I'm still of the opinion that, you know, he's not really quite certain what a bad day is, but I was in shock, the fact that I got nicked for it, you know, and they were coming with this harassment and that, and then I seen 13 statements and I was reading them and I was just like, who is this person? You know, in one hand is this, you know, but really he's apparently terrified. And it was a bit shocking, to be honest, as someone I certainly never expected. And instead of, at the time, I mean, I was, my head was all over the place and had a lot of my own problems going on. But I just jumped on it for all the wrong reasons. And I jumped on it and, you know, I was channeling a lot of my own shit towards, towards what was going on. But I still in the same breath couldn't actually believe what I was hearing and what I was reading. And I got a lot of shit, you know, myself for the things I've done. But as well, I've never been exposed for anything, ever. You know, anything negative that's out there, I've put it out there myself. You know, nobody's told me anything about myself that I haven't already put out there, or that I don't already know, or that people don't already know. So, all these tales of bad things I've done have been put out there by me. You know. Is that so one no one so no one's got anything hanging over you to try and maybe because people like to think I've got this, I've got that, I can do this and do that. Fuck it, I'm so what? Do you know right. what I mean? That it's easier when you you become truly clean and go, do you know what? Say what you've got to say that every single person on this planet has fucked up. Every yeah. single person on this planet is a bit deluded. Like we all believe our own shit. Everybody we don't know what's going on in everybody else's brain. Like yeah. it's just a mad environment, it's a mad life, but this is the life we're in. This is a the age that we're in that people can do videos and that like you've got to remember you're doing videos calling people out saying you're going to do this <clears throat> that's a guilty straight away that's evidence there straight away yeah, that you've done it you uh -huh. can't deny that yeah. like, so you've got to couldn't. take responsibility as well as somebody right. stuck you in okay uh -huh. but you you done that oh, you done the videos bro I don't like, agree anymore like, like, you, yeah. you, people watching go well you're, you're <clears> done bank your rights and it's very easy to point the finger and say it's yeah. his fault or it's their fault but yeah. I mean the whole thing was my fault you're a million percent no doubt about it do you know what I mean no. and it is hard if, if you think two fighting men then you're expecting do you know what let's meet up have a tear up shake hands walk away but obviously when people start phoning the police or you get sent to prison then you're going to be even more bitter mm -hmm. if you're in prison thinking I've not got, I'm not going to see my granddad, the man who's raised me because of this man. You're blaming every you single other person for your own fuck up for doing the videos instead of going, do you know what? I'm in here because of me. Yeah. And that's the thing. That's when people get the realisation that, wait a minute then, I, that's when the changes start happening in your life, I believe anyway. Yeah. But did you ever expect that you were going to get sentenced? Yeah. Did you know? Yeah, just threw me barrister telling me, you know, this is, this is guilty here. I mean, I even, I was, I tried to change my plea. 
I tried to change my plea to not guilty, but they wouldn't have it. And the court wouldn't have it. We had a good case for not guilty, I feel. But me being me as well in the interview, just admitted to everything, you know. I didn't do myself any favours, but, you know, you live and learn. But it's on about, you know, as far as on about blaming myself, it was the first time round them first 11 weeks. Oh, it was not my fault. I shouldn't have been here. You know what I mean? And that was wrong. But I was out, I was out 11 week on a tag. And uh, then I was sentenced for 16 months to Crown Court for uh, witness intimidation, harassment, malicious communications, and I think that might have been it. But um, second time round, I had about a week in Durham. And I, I chinned this kid in Durham. I lost my head and I hit this kid in the queue. Why? Uh, pushed in front of us, mate, when I was speaking to a screw about my allocation. I'd been, I'd been sentenced. I was desperate to know which prison I was going to. Were you scared? No. And, um, well, perhaps, perhaps, yeah. But at that time, no. You know, I was maybe deep down a bit scared. You know, it's not a nice environment. And uh, it certainly hit home once I'd hit this kid because he had a lot of boys. He had a big team. And I uh, caused a bit of chew for myself. And I got moved off the wing. Uh, they stopped the, I was screaming at the pad door. They were, all these lads were screaming at me. I was screaming at them, you know. I couldn't get my mouth shut. And they opened the door and said, you know, Christy, you're away. You're going to die. So you're going on the other wing. So I went to B-wing. Two days later, they come and got us. to took us to Kirkham, open prison. Because my offence was immediate, I immediately qualified for Cat D with my offence because it was witness intimidation without violence. And it was just such a law down, a law, defense, a law mm -hmm. charge, I think. I immediately qualified for this Cat D. So two days, or three days later, after I hit this kid, um, they come and got us, took us to Kirkham, and I thought, oh, this is great, I got there, it was brilliant, I've said it before, I mean, I thought I was at a christening when I got there, there was kids and women and that everywhere, it wasn't like a prison. One day I had there, and then the nick can come through on the system. Come and got us off the induction wing in the morning, this nick come through, you shouldn't be here. I got took to Preston, and uh, by that point I'd done three jails in three days, and the stress was through the roof. I was sick. And uh, a couple of it was a couple of days before Christmas. The chaplain come and got us. I knew it was bad news. Took us down to the chapel, told us that my auntie had died from Burnley, and I was real tight with her, like real tight with her. And I had a massive breakdown in the chapel, mate. I was in there crying for about two hours. And uh, it was only then, and only then that I uh, completely blamed myself, and I recognised, you know what I mean, that this was entirely my fault nobody else's there was a million and one things i could have done apart from the things that i done and i didn't you know i chose to do what i done you know what i mean and that is my fault no one else's and it was only at that point when i had a real breakdown um i said 19 nights in that preston was probably the 19 loneliest nights of my life you know what i mean that was horrendous i hated that prison hated it and uh you know i think from that point the realization that it was my fault, no one else's. Uh, definitely come with a. I think it was, it was growth, you know, over time from that. You know, the recognition of you know, it was just completely my fault. Up until that day, it was everyone else's fault. But uh, definitely came to the realization that I'd been a proper twat, and uh, went about it, went about things, you know, the completely the wrong way. And like I say, we live and learn, don't we? And there's no other, you know. <laughs> You know, you're on your you're on your knees in a chapel crying for hours. A proper breakdown. Uh you don't forget things like that, mate. Places that you don't ever want to go again emotionally, you know? Yeah. That's because your, your first time your freedom's been took away. It's the first time you've been in prison. That like, mm. I was the same. When I went to prison I realised I ain't coming back here. Yeah. I value my freedom too much. I yeah. value life. I value I've made that's why I've always been careful over the last few years to changing my life and doing certain things that you don't have a, like, if, time is so valuable on this earth, no matter if you're in prison for a week or 30 years, your time is so valuable and you'll never ever get it back. Now you seem to have fought the biggest slump in your life when you're in prison because you lost two of the biggest people in your life yeah. and that's always going to play a massive effect on your mind that what if I've never done that and I could have spent more time with them but in all honesty you'd probably just, you probably, probably wouldn't have re realised how much your life is worth if it never happened and there's always stages in your life where things happen for a reason yeah which is crazy when you first went to prison what was it like when you were on the bus driving to prison 
Uh, terrifying. Terrifying, mate. Um, I spoke about this on the Billy Moore podcast. Big shout out, Billy Moore. Billy, Moore. Billy, Billy. Billy and Joe Moore, yeah. Big shout out. <laughs> um, <clears throat> he had a brilliant day down there with them too. Uh, but yes, yeah, so, so I touched on it on his podcast. Uh, there was uh, some addict in the next, uh, next booth giving us a load of verbal. Didn't know what to make of it. Didn't know what to say. Hardly responded. Um, you know, I was going to be his bitch and that apparently. You know, I was going to... As soon as I was having a bit of a conversation with him, I mentioned it was my first time, he was howling. Oh, we've got a first time in here and that. You were cleaning my fucking pod boy on that. Didn't respond. I thought, oh, and I just didn't know what to think of it. Didn't know what to make. Didn't, certainly didn't like what he was saying anyway. <clears throat> you get off the bus to reception and you know, the wing was going mental. Something was happening on A-wing at the time and it was going mental when I got, when I got there. It was going bananas on that wing. And the wing's just there when you get off the bus, anyone that knows him been to Durham. And you go up the stairs to reception. And I remember going up the stairs in a bit of a queue. This kid, this idiot was in front of us, had been given his grief. And I remember my lip going on the way up the stairs, like proper going, like big time. And uh, I was like, come and sort yourself out, Danny, you know, you're in the big house now, you know, and sort yourself out. And uh, got up to reception. Started asking, I was the first one. This this kid sort of took a step for whatever reason. He he was the first one through the door, but he wasn't asked any questions first. He just sort of stood a couple of meters away. And name and that, you know, we were talking to us. And I remember my lip going and I couldn't speak. I couldn't get my words out because of the emotional state I was in. And this, this I just seen this kid's head turn and look at us and I knew he was, I knew he could see that I was upset. And I just snapped and I just, I cracked him, proper cracked him. And I give him another two or three cracks, and I just I'd have cracked him all day, and I jumped, got jumped on by other schools in reception, and I got twisted up so badly, mate. I was screaming in pain. I've got bad wrists and a bad ankle, man. And they were twisted up, and they were in my back pocket, and uh, I was screaming in pain. That was my first experience in prison. I'd been there five minutes, and I was screaming in pain. Did that bring back a lot of memories from school? People kind of try to not bullying, but antagonise. Uh, Initially, no, mate. Um, but I just remember, th I, you know, I just couldn't remember. I just, again, blaming everyone else. Just felt this massive injustice that I shouldn't be there. <laughs> I just felt that I just shouldn't have been there. Do you know what I mean? I was yeah, like, the world was fighting. Aye, it's like it's everybody else's fault. But, um, and like I said, it took a while for us to come to the realization it was all my fault. But uh, that was my first, first experience. And I got seven nickens in the first 10 days for fighting on the induction wing. I just could not keep my hands to myself. Anyone that come to me pad door and ask for a whitener or anything like that, I just crack them, you know, I just straight into them immediately. And uh, I started, I caused a bit of a bit of noise, you know. I got, I got invited to this kid into this kid's pad. Nathan, he was called. He was in there for a, a murder. He was back at court. He'd been, I think, he'd been sentenced, and he was back at Durham for something. Something, I think it was something to do with something that happened in prison, anyway. And. Uh, he had a word with us, you know what I mean? And uh, he was younger than me, by about 10 years, I think. But I've never listened to anybody so much. He's like, you need to, you know, calm yourself down. He said, you're making a bit too much noise and that. He said, you know, such and such and that. I'm not, not really happy with you and that. You know, he's give us a little bit of prison politics and that, if you like. And he said, you know, you're just a visitor. Look at me, he said, I'm not gonna be out for another 33 years. And he said, you know, you were just a visitor. I said, mind your neck in some, you know, you're just here and older. He said, just learn what you can. Told us a little bit about what I should and shouldn't be doing. Um, and he loaded us up. I was waiting on my first canteen, which I never got. And he loaded us up. He had like a load of canteen boxes under his bed. And he just loaded us up. Life as pads, the ram down there. He had everything. And he just loaded us up with like a big hamper. Sent us back to my pad. And I think from that day, really calm us all down. I never got into any more chew at all. What I did actually, I got into another bit of chew a few weeks later. There was a kid, stashed the black ball. I was seeing a lot of bird coming through at the time. So the whole wing got locked down because he'd hit the ball. So you can imagine how happy I was about that. You know what I mean? I'm a bird sitting on a visit. I never got out my pad. The whole wing never got out the pad. So the whole wing was boiling. And um, the next morning, it, you know, I conveniently told everyone where it was after he'd screwed everyone's visit. So he was out on the yard the next day. We, never, we missed a sosh, we missed an exercise because of that, and a visit. So the next <coughs> A-wing, B-wing yard in Durham, 
you know, if anyone's been there, know, top of the stairs from B Wing. Mr. McCarthy, Mr. Hunter, two screws I really got on with him, Mr. G, good screws. And um, I told them at the top of the stairs, I'm going to go down at the yard and I'm going to splatter that, mate. I'm going to kill that. And they were that boiling with him themselves. They said, you have got as long as it takes for us to slowly walk over there and stop you. So I did give me the green light, you know. So uh, we walked by his once, walked by his the second time and I just jumped on him. Just put a load of shots into him rather all over and I put a good knee into him as well, slammed him off the floor. And uh, they literally just, just felt a hand on me so softly. Come on, Christy, that'll do. Is that enough? And just walked us back to my pad and he didn't twist us up, did nothing, you know. And uh, the nicking for that disappeared. So I was buzzing. Did you start getting a bit of respect in? See, the only thing with that is when you're cracking people and battering people, you start getting a sense of power. And then mm. when people start respecting you, then you feel it. Did you feel as if you had to keep up that persona? A little bit. Um, I, I certainly projected the image of somebody who didn't give a fuck. No, definitely. But I don't think you do, Danny, if I'm honest. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I, 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 I know you bat a lot, Pierre. And I know that like, you can be hot and cold up and down, like just like everybody. But yeah, for me looking at the outside and me looking at your videos, there is a sense you who doesn't give a fuck, and that's a scary thing to be. Like you've always portrayed yourself, look, man. I, I'm not a fighting man, but mm. listen, I can have a tear up hand. I've got a big set of balls. Like, I don't think you would shy mm. away from anything. But when you're yeah. in that prison and you're getting that attention, does that feel? Is that a good buzz? Even though you're hurting other people to get it. Uh, I I think so. Yeah, I think so. Um. You know, it is it is empowering, if you like, you know, and you know, when people expect you to be taking a certain level of shit and you don't take it. You know, it's definitely I think it feel you know, it felt good at the time. Uh, definitely got plenty of respect off people and nobody bothered us, you know. Uh, um and uh, more and more Carlisle kept coming in. We had the cleaners, the cleaners was nearly all Carlisle in that wing. Uh, I think it was there was a thirteen cleaners or something. I think nine of them were Carlisle. So we had it cushy, you know, we did have it. I mean, it's prison, it's not good. It's not an ideal environment, but we definitely made it as, as good as we could, you know, there was parcels and that coming in and, you know, things were all right as as can be in, in jail, you know. Were you getting your puff? Hash? I was spending a fucking fortune on it, Was mate. it wheat hash on it? It's hash, not wheat, yeah. Hash, hash, we did get a bit of star dog on that little Would bit. You? Little bit, sir. Uh, Do you think um, that's one of the reasons at the start you were a bit fucking strung out because you never had anything? more angrier oh absolutely mate I absolutely I couldn't sleep for the first three, four <laughs> nightmares nights. long nights mate yeah. well once three or once you're in three or four days that's when the that's when the mm -hmm. the dreams and the nightmares still come and I'll never forget the dreams always used to be happy dreams and I'd always either be with a viewer or I'd be out somewhere doing something out of prison and then you wake up and you're in prison you know that was the dreams were so vivid you know it's like i was there the dreams are so deep and vivid aren't they when you're getting clean mm -hmm. like they are now you know i'm 10 days clean at the minute so congratulations brilliant. brother thank you and um you know it was very much that the dreams and that was the that was and that was horrible you know to have these vivid dreams where you're so convinced of the you know that you're not in prison you're having a good time away and whatever and you open your eyes and you're fucking in prison. Like, that was depressing, you know, and not a very good way to start your day. Yeah. You know I mean? So how many fights do you think you were in the, the full couple of months you were there? <clears throat> a few months you were there? Maybe I had 10 or 12, 10, 10, 11 fights easy. The first 11, in the 11 weeks, didn't I was first there. Does the people go through a full life sentence, mate, and don't have fucking one fight? <laughs> um, does that make you question yourself as well? Wait a minute, fuck me, let me be armorless, Karen. <clears throat> I have definitely, have to, I'm working on myself a lot at the minute. And I know looking back in the past and that I've, you know, my temper's been fucking out of control. My temper's, I rage, you know what I mean? I do, and when I vex, I cry, you know what I mean? And I get that point when I am crying and I am upset, I get this feeling, you know, that I can, I could fucking punch a hole in a tank. You know, I get this feeling of, it's not a nice feeling by the way, but um, like I've got, when, I, when I get to that point of emotional, turmoil like I'm not upset it's like I've got to channel it somewhere and it's usually rage you know I usually turn to being violent and uh I don't want to do that anymore mate I don't want to be that person anymore you know and it's difficult because you know, we are who we are it's like my, nearly like my programming it's like your paradigm and uh you know I'm not really proud or pleased of the person that I've been in the past especially some of the impulsive behavior that I, that I you know do and a lot of character defects, mate, and uh, 
this working on myself, this getting clean, you know, this going to fellowship, this, it's, it's the biggest job I've ever taken on in my life, you know, getting clean, addressing myself, looking at myself, it's difficult, mate, it's really hard. And uh, these last 10 days I've been all over the place. I've taken a lot of volume on the quiet in that last year, smoking weed all day, sniffing whiff all night, and then taking volume to get to sleep. You know, it just seems, it just seems to fucking repeat itself. And because I was making work, <clears throat> because I was paying bills, you know, it took us a long time to recognize it as a problem. You know, I'm an addict, it's as simple as that. And I've got the disease of addiction. And I don't know if it's genetic or what, but I seem to come from a long line of junkies, you know? And, uh, you know, it is what it is, but uh, it's definitely a big job what I've taken on this. But especially these last three or four days, <clears throat> feelings, you know, someone said, I went for a breathe the night, and someone said the best thing about recovery is getting your feelings back. Mm -hmm. That's the worst thing about recovery as well, getting your yeah, feelings back. you start getting you know? a fucking, you start growing a conscience. Uh -huh. Everything that you think you've, wasn't really you, yes, you're admitting that, but everything you've done wrong comes to you a hundred times worse, bro. And yes, that's when you realise, wow, because you're so deluded, you're so caught up in your own little box that you don't want to think about the things you've done. Mm. You don't want to think about no. the people you've upset. You don't acknowledge the pain Because everybody caused. else is to blame. So once you actually yeah. start grabbing your reins, start becoming clean, you're the conscience, everything you've suppressed down here just comes to the surface and you realise, oh, wait a minute, was that that person? And that's the difficult part. But you're a fighting man, clearly. This is the biggest fight of your life, to stay clean, not just for you, but for your kids, because yeah. your kids are a reflection of you. That's what keeps me going. Yeah. And like we spoke earlier, like everything I'm doing, comes more pressure is that just added pressure and added pressure and I'm not used to that I'm not used mm -hmm. to trying yeah. to have a successful life and try to do the right things and come across professional because sometimes the people knew what was going on here they would think you ain't professional yeah. but I present myself in a better manner that I act professional and that's all you can do is your actions speak louder than your words but yeah. for taking that first step and, and try to change no matter what age you are I take my hat off to you, brother, because it's an amazing thing change is a beautiful thing that it certainly is it's such a beautiful thing when you start realising inwards that you're changing nothing outside can really hurt you anymore and i mm -hmm. always say this saying but if there's no enemy within the enemy outside can't do you no harm and that's the position i'm in that's why i don't yeah bite that's why i don't retaliate sometimes mm -hmm. listen fucking idiots need put in a place from time to time some yeah. idiots need fucking battered fuck out from time to time of course, they do. Of course do you know what i mean that that's life at, we're warriors we're hunters at the end of the day but yeah. it's embedded in us yeah but you, know you can sit back and relax and go do you know what when i'm ready I'll load up the gun, fire back when I need to fire back. Yeah. For me, that's a bit of strength. Yeah, people say, yeah. oh, don't do this and do that. Excuse but it's me. hard because we are men. Uh -huh. We are men. Like every, every man thinks they can fight. Every man thinks there's something special. And I get it. That's a good thing to do. But yeah. I'm sorry to burn, like, to let people know, but he's, he's ain't all that, some of these, man. Uh -huh. like, he's need to fucking take uh -huh. a couple of steps back and realise I've still got a lot of work on that. Like, of course, mate. Even myself, my life is going great, but I don't ever say that I'm the happiest man in the, in the world because I'm still fucking battling. Yeah. I thought that everything I had now would cure all the pain. Yeah. If anything, it's fucking <laughs> made it worse, Danny. Yeah. It's fucking uh -huh. made it worse, bro. And I'm yeah. thinking, like, what is that I'm doing then? Uh -huh. Is it me? Is just totally fucking wired up wrong? Or am I chasing the wrong thing? Like, it's difficult. It's mate. just constant question marks, and I think that's just I think that's called life, bro. Yeah. Like, we question everything, but once you've got a conscience, once you're clean, your soul is pure and your heart is pure as it can be. Like, like I say, I still got a lot of bad thoughts. I don't act on those thoughts, but I'm trying to take away the darkness I'm trying to just be as good as I can be when the people can go do you know what if he can change I can change and there's yeah. so many great people out there who's been in recovery for 20 30 40 years and you think wow they just look different their presence is different their mm -hmm. energy is different they don't look tense like sometimes my, I can still tense up because I'll think about something and I just tense you, up you just, you don't it's a mad it, hang me when you started getting out of prison when you were getting out of prison how was that a relief for you? Um, got out of prison second time the last time was uh, <clears throat> I had a lot of support and uh, I was seeing a lass at the time, really nice lass, and uh, I was living just out of town with her. And for whatever reason, I've done the same thing as what I've done with nearly every decent relationship I've had in my life. I just woke up one morning and thought, nah, don't want it. Without good reason. It's commitment issues. I've just thought, don't want it. Don't want this. Things are going good, things are going great. You don't feel as if you deserve it? For whatever reason, mate, I can't put, I haven't quite, dis, you know, really got to the bottom of that yet. But I'll get there. But um, 
you know, I've done that with so many good relationships, solid relationships, nice people, you know, and I've just woke up one morning and just done what I've done so many times. Just opened my eyes and thought, nah, not for me. I want to be on my own. Yeah, that's hard. Like, when did you, so your aunt passed away in prison, your granddad was dying. Like, seeing your, oh, your granddad passed away, seeing when you went back to prison, hmm. like, What's going through your mind then? Were you thinking, you know what, was it revenge or was it, I'm going to try and change my life? I couldn't help but um, still really want to put my hands on that person. And it was like a, just someone I always had in my head and I knew that, that was going to happen one day. You know, I know there was legal restrictions in place, they're still in place now. You know, there's certain things working behind the scenes to get them sorted, but we'll leave that there. But um, certainly had a passion for hurting that, you know, person. And, uh, you know, I thought about it almost on a daily basis. You know, fantasized over busting him up. And uh, it was, I was, I was writ off by a lot of people and even people close to us. I said, I think you better behave, you know, you'll get hurt here. I knew different, you know, I knew different. Um, I know what I'm capable of doing. And, uh, you know, I couldn't help but, you know, this thing living in your head rent free and that's a big, big thing now, what everyone keeps saying and repeating and that, but I oh, was there, mate, you know, I couldn't help but, you know, and it's going back to what I'm saying, what I said earlier about, I can't afford to be like that no more, mate. I can't afford to have that person or any person, you know, in my head like that. You know what I mean? It's, it's, and I'm not forgiving anybody for them. It might sound selfish, but I'm, I'm doing this for me. And I'm forgiving that person for my own reasons because I cannot move forward with my own life. With that level of, you know, hatred towards another person, it's really, really unhealthy, you know, and I would advise anybody that, no, I would advise anybody, you know, don't hate anybody, you know. It's difficult, take it from me. It is very, very difficult to let go especially when someone's, you feel like someone's put you through so much and they're still, you know, twining because they're getting called names. You know, you, you think, you think you've got all the reasons in the world to continue hating this person, but, you know, take a look at yourself, mate, and ask yourself what it's cost you, you know, what this hatred towards another person has cost you and will continue to cost you. And that's the question that I've asked myself, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot lately and, you know, what do I want? I still don't know, mate. What do I want? But I know what I don't want. And I don't want to hate anybody. Yeah, that's a great start. That's a great start. How long was it before you got a prison to the fight you had? How long? Um, it was a decent 20 month. So a long time to bottle up all that emotion. Hate for each other. Like, yeah. It goes both ways, doesn't it? Of course like, it does. The river, it goes deep with yeah. both of you. Like, of course. It's obviously just became to the surface now that a lot of people are speaking about it. And when I first joined this, the podcast, I was one of the first to start like four years ago. And, yeah. Um, and it was a great life, Killing man. You, mate. It was just good, man. <laughs> just having a laugh and interviewing people. And I'm still kind of stuck to it. Yes, people have kind of fell away to the wayside. And I will give everybody a chance. I genuinely will. If you're mm. good to me, like, ah, I'm friends with murderers drug lords bank robbers yeah I don't look at their past I look for when I meet them and we're still in contact like I say 99% of the people on this podcast will still keep in touch they'll still speak highly of me because I've never fucked anybody over just yeah. certain people you put to the side because you just don't want anything to do with them and everything yeah. I've kind of everybody I've kind of stood back from has kind of proved that I was right it's not that it's right for me they can necessarily say <clears> something <throat> different but I only look after me and yeah. when I cut somebody off it's done there's no turning back. There's no sorries. You know, you'll never see me say sorry to somebody. You'll never see me come forward and mm -hmm. bigging people up and and doing this and jumping from camp to camp to camp. That ain't fucking me. I'm me. I'm I'm a man who has morals. I believe. Yes, I, I fuck up every single other person, but you don't see me jumping around and causing shit and stirring the pot. Some people might say I do, but I don't. Or else mm -hmm. I could fire back every single day. But I know how tiring that shit is. When you eventually got the call that the fight might happen because you can't take it away from him he is a fighting man he can scrap he is Fine. a fucking scrapper like mm -hmm. five stone heavier as well that like, if all, all honesty you're thinking a hundred times that fight happens bare knuckle champion five stone heavier you're choosing him a hundred times for looking from the outside yeah people never give you a fucking chance 
when yeah. you got that fight, when you got the call, because it must have been going back and forth for, as you say, 20 months. Mm -hmm. How did it no. come about that you eventually decided, right, let's fucking do it? <coughs> well, I think it had been a decent 20 months or whatever down since I got out of the nick. Um, a lot of my licence and that extensive, you know, anger management and all this stuff with probation and that went on for a while. And uh, out of nowhere, and I mean nowhere, um, I was mentioned again and I was threatened. And I couldn't get my head around it thinking, you know, I'm trying my best here to forget about you. And uh, she wouldn't let us, would not let me forget. A lot of me, me own past and me own mistakes were being brought up again, um, threatened and threatened and threatened some more. And I decided after two or three threatening videos towards myself, that I'd respond, knowing full well I shouldn't have been because there was legal restrictions. And um, I responded and uh, found myself back in the same position I was in, the very position that got us sent to prison. That not backing down, not giving a fuck, you know, let's do it type of attitude. And uh, I was offered this fight, the phone rang. It was, you know, some people and they says, you know, this fight's happening. You know, you're fighting him in, I think it was six days time. Well, it was six days. I think the call come on the, the week before and on the Thursday or something when I was fighting him the following Friday. I was given an option, you know, if you don't want to fight him, like a public apology. Well, there's probably more chance of Nelson getting his eye back, you know, than me apologising, you know. And like I say, I maybe forgive, but I haven't forgot and I'll never apologise. So I was given the option, you can apologise, <clears throat> you can face him. No, it's obvious what I've done, but I couldn't help but think on the run-up to the fight that I had the edge, because someone I've never mentioned until now was that person was ringing Paul all week. I'd already got Paul. I'd rung Paul. Big shout out, Paul Venice, by the way. Seems a nice man. Brilliant man. I've never met him, but everything I like, so, I like what he's about. I like how he carries himself. I owe, I owe Paul a lot, mate. I owe him an awful lot. I owe him you know, more than I can put into words in this podcast. But <clears throat> I spoke to Paul, you know, for about two years. While we're on that, the, the, the way I'm, the, how I met Paul when, when these interviews, when these, when these, when these, when these videos, sorry, were going about and me, been a tit basically, <laughs> threatening, uh, threatening people and, you know, saying I'd disco anywhere and all this stuff. These videos were online and obviously I mean, I didn't, from an outsider looking in, I took some of them old videos and I think, what a twat, you know, you wanker, mate. You think that's the, all right now, see, when you come clean, mate, it's only going to ever get worse, I mate. Because the majority I'm of you are probably high as fuck, mate, on yeah, the videos, you know, know what I mean? I Full know. of volume, not giving a fuck, absolutely, mate. Absolutely, <laughs> Fucking absolutely. And um, I, they're on the internet, and I never uploaded any videos, but somebody did. And uh, I'm, 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 I'm at, at this point, when I'm new to everything, I couldn't get in over the comment. Every two minutes I'm reading comments. That's bad for you, mate. I don't advise anybody yeah. to do that. You know what I mean? So I'm doing this and I sees this comment, Paul Venice, just seen this big lump in a, with a world title around his waist. Uh, he said, I'll fight you. And I won't repeat what I said to him. <laughs> but he knows what I said. And uh, I give him a lot of verbal. And uh, the phone rang, it was Gary Furby. Big shout out Gary Furby, another, another friend of mine. And he says, he'd seen what was going on back and forth between me and Paul. I said, Danny, do yourself a favour. Behave, mate. They'll just eat you. He'll eat you. He said, type his name in YouTube there. So I typed in Paul. You know, when you just put the, just got to the V, Paul yeah. V. <laughs> just come up. Paul Venice, top 10 savage knockouts. And like I say, I've just seen big heavyweights getting flopped all over the place. And I'm like, this is fucking bonny, this. You know, what am I going to do with that? Gary said, I've given you a number. He's going to ring you. He rung us up. Nicest man I've ever can remember speaking to, so nice, so polite, didn't sort of reflect in this video of this person that I'd seen. And that's how we got speaking, me and Paul. So put that to bed. So I knew what Paul was, I knew what he could do. So I rung him up and said, look, would you mind being my man? My fair play man, couldn't think of anyone better, you know. I said, do you mind being my fair play man down here? Not a problem, you know, absolutely. Because we'd built up a 
decent relationship, just speaking, you know, through on messages and that during the last time. So I rung Paul, Paul said, yeah. So I rung these lads back. I said, it's on, the fight's on, see you Friday. So during this week, fight week, we'll call it, this thing, person, was ringing Paul more or less every night, pressing for this apology. Sounded to me like he didn't want the fight. Sounded to me like he wanted an apology. And I couldn't help but draw strength from that. And every time I says, well, you know what I says every time. I said, tell me the sticky fucking apology. I'll see him Friday. And I drew strength from that. All week I drew strength from that. Do you think if you apologised it would have ended though? No. It would have been, I would have been down here then to him. And that was never going to happen. And I wanted him to know what I could do. And then I was getting advice off everybody, even my loved ones. Don't do it. Probably good advice. But I, you know, pride kicks in, mate. Yeah. I wouldn't let it, I wouldn't let that happen. But I had to, I, I could not help but draw strength from that. You know, he wants an, you know, just saying, if you can apologise, you know, you don't have to fight him. I know you said that yesterday, mate. You know what I mean? Um, and when I got down there, I locked eyes with him. Got in there and locked eyes with him. He looked away. He looked away. And I knew then, then I had the edge, you know. I mean, I was supposed to get steamrolled, remember? Look at the weight difference, look at the credentials, you know what I mean? That fight was never meant to go that way, apparently to the public's opinion, but I knew that was the least I was gonna do. And I wasn't really happy with the draw, but I took it for my own reasons. But um, I looked away and I couldn't help but think, I sort of turned me back. He looked away and I turned me back and I was doing some stretching, whatever. Nothing at all on my mind. And it just, because I never clicked, he looked away straight away, you know, I never clicked, it never registered immediately, but I had my back to him and I thought, he just looked away there. And at that second, when it clicked in my mind, I jumped through the ropes, you know, so I'm in the ring first now. And I just felt these things, these psychological things were, they, 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 you know, they do build up, you know, these things do happen, you know, these things, these little things do happen, you know, as a fighter. You know, I've had 30 fights myself and I know you can go in there without the edge. He went in there without the edge. I had the edge that day, I know that. But um, like I say, still, <clears throat> the emotion hindered my performance. And I was fighting him on a punch by punch basis, like I said. I wasn't thinking ahead like I can do, you know. And if this ever happens again, like I say, it'll be a completely different fight, you know, because there will be venom, you know, and I will commit to punches like I always do. But um be a different show, mate, you'll see. You don't usually see bare knuckles in a 12, a 12 foot ring though, did that change your tactics? Usually it's an open space or a full size ring. That changed the tactics in a big way. Who do you think that benefited? Him. Because of the movement, you'd have been a lot sharper on your toes, well, do you think? Um, without putting him down, he can't cut a ring off, you know? Yeah, he's a scrapper, man. He's, he's, he's a fucking proper scrapper. Right. Like. But but I, but I, say, I don't think he could cut the ring off as well. You know, I didn't, you know, I've been, been in there with some good operators in my time, mate. And, um, without putting anybody down. I've beat better people than that. On the street, I've beat bigger people than that, harder people than that. And um, I was confident in what I could do. But I knew immediately he couldn't cut the ring off, you know. But it, I mean, I was backing up in straight lines. I'm making a lot of my own mistakes. You know, listen, the fight was, the fight went the way it went. But um, we didn't know it was in a ring until, sorry, we knew it was in a ring but only when I was traveling down, I was told it was in a ring. I thought it was a big ring, 20 foot, I didn't know. I just thought a ring. 12 foot ring is the smallest ring you can get. But I've spent my life in a 12 foot ring. You know, I mean, whole training I've ever done, you know, 10 years, I've never out of a gym for 10 years, till I was 21. And I spent my life in a 12 foot ring. I know I've got wheels and I can move. But it did change the tactics because, you know, especially on the way down, I only found out it was in a ring. And on the run up to that fight, especially all the psychological preparation that I was doing and the visualization, which is so important. Um, I, I visualized it in a car park, warehouse, whatever. You know, and my plan was, excuse me, plan was not to throw any heavy leather for the first couple of minutes. Just nudge back, nudge back, nudge back. You know, and I just wanted to get a good long read of him. And, you know, once your feet start finding the beat, you know what I mean? You start, you know what I mean? I'm going to start opening him up. But that never happened. The tactic never went that way because, you know, it was what it was. I mean, 12-foot ring, you don't, you know, 
you better start dropping leather fast or you're going to know all about it. So, uh, yeah, it definitely changed the tactics that I had in mind, but I've got to give myself a little bit of credit for adapting on the on the fly, you know, and just adapting there and then, you know, and it, it never discouraged us one bit. You know, Paul went in and had a little squint about and come in and said, there's a, about seven of them in there. And he said, and you know, it's a 12 foot ring. For whatever reason, that just gave us strength, especially when we were about five minutes away, the ex-wife rung up. She's like, you do know it's going live on Instagram in five minutes. She said, ah, I said, you joke. And she said, no, no, we've all got it on the big screen. So I've got my tribe now watching her, all my four girls and my son watching me on the big screen. And that only gave me strength, you know what I mean? There was absolutely no way on earth I was going to get embarrassed in front of me when I knew my kids were watching. I could have been in with a lot better man than I was. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't getting embarrassed that day. And, um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I remember that giving us a lot of strength. I remember thinking this, you know, this is not, not happening. And during that time, on the crossover to the, getting out the car and walking to the gym, I said to Paul, <clears throat> I said, I've got kids watching this. Um, I said, you were here. I said, you, you know, Ben, man, I've got kids watching this. I said, Paul, I said, if I'm not in a position to continue, it was difficult to tell him, you know, it's words I didn't want to say, but I said, I want you to pull us out because as long as I'm able to stand back on my two feet, I am going to keep fighting today, you know? I said, so you know, you know fighting. I said, and if I'm not in a position to continue, I said, I want to get home today, you know? I want to go home. I want to be able to go home. I said, remember that. He already knew that anyway. You know, I said, ah, I knew that, you know? yeah. Fair play to uh, Dougie and Paul, though, two fair, great fair play men who, it was an honest fight. It was, was a fair fight. It was it a was. fucking great fight, if I'm honest. Like, people just love combat and, and for two men to have a proper tear up different way, but it, is, it was respect, know what I mean? For a, it's just unbelievable to see people standing, the face covered in blood. And did you feel the extra few stone on? Did you feel that power? I can definitely crack without a doubt. Um, <coughs> again, not putting anybody down here, but um, I've been cracked a bit harder than that, quite a bit harder than that, you know. And still managed to stay on my feet. With gloves though or knuckles? No, but with knuckles and and well with both actually. Mm -hmm. Sparring partner at the minute, Mickey Stewart. Big shout out Mickey Stewart. Um he's an animal, mate. He is an animal. And he can put them together in fours and fives, you know. And he punches harder than that man. But it's you know, styles make fights, you know, it doesn't matter necessarily how hard someone can crack, you know what I mean? Styles make fights. But I still feel <clears throat> You know, with the right head on us, it's tailor made for me and my style. It's just an opinion. You know. Did you ever think that you were going to get set up or anything driving there? Who's no. destination? Who picked the destination? Who picked the time? Who it was picked all the picked day? on their side, everything. I jumped through every hoop that was put in front of us. I never, I never picked anything. No hesitation about, I could get in here, man. It could be a fucking set up, nah. no. Not with Paul. No, not with Paul there. Um, that gave you a bit of belief and a bit of calmness that if he's yeah. there if he's in your side then it did it did but as well i mean big shout out to dougie dougie and dean because they are fair men the gypsies man like they're, that's that's their life like fair play and, and absolutely and, and they do the right thing they're all about, they're all about fair play. a bit of morals which a lot of people don't have anymore like yeah i respect that a lot likewise so and likewise and you know i was I was, I was never under any illusion. I never ever thought at any point that this was going to go wrong. I mean, it's little old me. I was sat there at 13 stone four. You know, I jumped through every hoop that was put in front of us. Get down there on this day. You know, the only thing I had, I, you know, I wanted to wear wraps. You know, my knuckle was exposed, but I needed to support my wrists and my thumb because I've got bad hands. I've had over, you know, I must have had nearly 30 breaks in the right hand and I've had about a dozen in the left hand. I've got really, really bad hands. And that's the only thing I wanted. I wanted to be able to wrap my wrist and thumb. And that was fine, providing the knuckle was exposed. So that was only my, my only request, really. It was that. And mm -hmm. I, I would have went further down the country. And you know, if, if the ring was smaller, I would have probably got in. There was nothing going to stop me putting hands on him that day. After the fight, though, there seemed to be a bit of animosity. You still didn't really want to shake hands. And was there a bit of... What, were you and Dougie? What happened there? Like, <coughs> you just didn't want... You just want <coughs> listen, your emotions are riding high, so you just don't really want to talk to anybody. But what is the, what happened with all that situation? Um, well, I think, personally... I mean, I mean, Dougie, you're cool now. You know what I mean? I've smoothed it yeah, off with Dougie's him. Sound, man. We were cool. I was cool with him 
immediately after, you know, immediately after that little back and forth that we had. But it was, I feel, need to be round here, Mosh. That's something I've said now for years. Need, there's need to be round here, Mosh. I've said that for years, and anyone that knows us will confirm that that's something I've said for years. And I feel that he thought I was maybe mocking travellers by saying that. I feel that's what he thought. Um, it was my opinion. You know, and looking back, I think that's maybe what he thought. He maybe thought I was somehow mocking the travelling community by saying that, because they use motion divvy. They say them things. And I thought, you know, he maybe thinks I'm mocking him in some way. And, uh, you know, he said what he said, and I said what I said, and, you know, it was what it was. You know, I'm no, no chew with him. I've actually got a lot of respect for him and Dean. So you know, that just, just was what it was. There's a lot of testosterone flying about in that, in that room at that time, yeah. so... So what happened then driving home after that? Did you feel a sense of relief? Did you feel victory? Did you feel like, okay, it's over? Or was a part of you still inside that thought, this is only the beginning for more to come? Uh, initially, no. Initially, I felt like a winner. I know it was a draw. But I, initially, I felt like a winner. I couldn't help feel like a winner because I'd sort of set out almost to do what I always said internally that I was going to do. I was going to turn up. I was going to put good hands on him. And I wasn't going to be anybody's divvy. You know, and I think, you know, I, I, I achieved what I set out to do and um, like I say I kind of thought it was going to go away but there was a relief you know there was a there was a relief you know thinking that that it was over but I mean it wasn't you know but as far as the like I say the hatred the animosity strong dislike you know whatever you want to call it towards that person for me I've had to let that go I've had to let that go for my own reasons. But it appears, you know, that we have unfinished business, you know, and you know, I haven't yet said this, you know, to Dean and Dougie, but this will be my last fight, win, lose or draw. And I can take getting starched in 10 seconds. I can take that as a man. Like I say, I've got other plans, but, um, if that happens, so be it, you know. By the grace of God, I'll, I'll walk, I'll, I'll come out of there and I'll be fine, I'm certain of that. And I'm certain I've been protected by a higher power my entire life. Because I've been shot and stabbed and I've had so many near-death experiences. Um, I feel, I can't help but feel I've been protected. And um, whatever happens will happen. And I'll be fine, no matter what. And like I say, I can take an early night. If it's an early night for me, it's an early night for me. I can take that as a man. And uh, when this happens, I am turning my back on the whole saga. And I'm walking away because I need to do this for myself. I can't be entangled or be engaged in this thing anymore. 19th of March isn't a long time away. You know, I'm not carrying this cloud around above us i'm not carrying this level of hatred about anymore so things are internally personally starting to feel better and better but i'm more than happy you know to put some closure on this once and for all you know and uh, i'm anticipating a very different performance and this time i'll shake his hand and i'll mean it he's an, he's free to have his own opinion on me i'm not even going to attempt to you know, influence or change that. He can do what he wants with, you know, with his opinion on me. That's his business. This, this is going to be the end. This will be the end, you know. And if it doesn't happen, you know, I'll have to get used to that. And I can walk away and I can never mention him and I can never look at him and I can never, you know, have him in my head again in a negative fashion. But, uh, you know, I feel something that I would like to do for some closure on the whole, like I say, saga, affair, yeah, but, but after the first fight, it seemed at the right time, it was a draw, move on. So if you beat him or he beats you, then it's going to be revenge. Do you know what I mean? For some part, and that's, and and for me, looking at the outside, I look at people's actions and I think no matter what's said, right or wrong, people are still going to react and people still crave attention. People still love, whether it's positive or negative, mm -hmm. people can thrive on that shit. And I think that's why I don't get involved because I think there's no matter what you say to mm -hmm. some people, they just don't get it. They don't understand that. They don't get it. And I understand when, that. When you get out of prison as well, <laughs> like, what what what's your restrictions then? What was your restrictions towards him? Like what happened? Like no don't contact. go near him, can't like with no contact, but what like uh 
a video mentioning his name is that you done straight away aye so what's going through your mind then when you're called up out for a fight knowing <laughs> we end up getting fucking viewed millions of times that you, so not only you think can you imagine you lost that you lost you're straight back into prison you're back in prison again you're missing your kids because by the, the effects it had on you last time losing people that you loved you kind of never let that go if it happened again then there's there's never any a, a way out so it's like you're constantly playing with fire as well yeah because you're, you're, you're for me speaking to you now it feels like your whole life's already been in chaos anyway so when you're trying to make the changes but you you all understand it in three four months time once you become clean and you go wait a minute it was fucking chaos yeah. because when you're sitting in calmness or when you're content you think this isn't normal so mm -hmm. i'll go and create chaos so I know that's what yeah. people do because I've done it for years like my mind was a fucking hurricane yeah. then I started changing and then I started saying it's okay actually this is okay life here when nothing's happening you're sitting yourself yeah. because when you're doing that you think something's not right so I'll go and cause a bit of shit mm -hmm. so when you uh, get called out for the fight then you potentially going back to prison was that already in your mind did you, no. did you or did you think it was over with? I never ever considered or you know it never crossed my mind that I was ever going to lose that fight it just never I never ever I knew if it happened I could have took it as a man I could have took it. If I got starched in 10 seconds, I could have took it as a man. You know, I'm not genetically built for taking on heavyweights. And I just could have took that, I could have swallowed it, no problem. But I never ever considered, you know, what my mind might have been like if I'd have lost that fight. Because it was never an option for me to lose. And um, <clears throat> going back just to what we were saying there, if, if I get starched, then I'm telling you now, and everybody that that's it for me i can take that as a man so when i win you know it's up to him how he handles that if he wants to continue to call me out or harass me in any way shape or form you've heard it here first I'm not interested that's his business this is for me it's personal and i don't mean personal between me and another man i mean personal between me and me once it's done for me it's done. I wanted that last time. It didn't quite happen. I'm certain this time that I can walk away regardless of what's been said and regardless of the decision. You know, there will not be a draw. It's one of the conditions. There's no draw on the table. It's last, last man, man standing. Last man standing. Yeah. But what about your recall? So what happened there then when you, after your fight, you've got Christmas and then did the, what, uh, what was the recall for? Because slight, there's a slight. lot of fucking people out there with their own speculation well, pointing been, their fingers. I've been locked up um, since the fight, before Christmas, a couple of days before Christmas Eve, I was locked up. I was locked up 23 hours and anybody that's been locked up in the local police station will say the same, I think. See, once you, it's usually about the 12 hour mark for me. Once I'm in about 12 hours, I start praying for jail. You know, I start praying for, you know, I'd rather be at jail. You know, I'd rather be, you start, I think, I think it's designed for that. You know what I mean? You start thinking, you just, I'd be excited just to get on the bus. I mean, it's just like your head's just spinning in there. You'd probably be buzzing just to get a pad, mate, and a kettle in my pad. You know what I mean? It's like it's that level of fr frustration that kicks in after about 12 hours for me. You know what I mean? I just cannot handle that blue mattress on its own. You know what I mean? I, I hate it. <clears throat> but um, four breaches, three video, one violent breach. There's levels of breach. And, uh, I was told by my solicitor I wasn't getting out. You know, I said, she said, forget about it. You know what I mean? Four breaches. She said, forget about it, you know? You'll be on the next bus. And they do it. It was a Friday night. I got locked up. Sorry, it wasn't. It was a Thursday. Thursday, late Thursday. And I went through and sort of missed the Friday court. And I'm stressing now more to the fact that I'm thinking I'm going to be locked up in here all weekend. I've just wanted to be in prison other than there. They said, oh, no, we've got a remand court on Saturday morning. You maybe end up getting remanded tomorrow morning. For whatever reason, that was relief. And uh, four breaches, like I say, one of them a violent breach. But for the first time ever, you know, what do you do when you're desperate, mate? You pray. And I prayed, and I prayed and prayed, and then um, begged, you know, that if, if there was anyone there, you know, and if anyone could help us, for them to help us, you know what I mean? I begged and begged for a Christmas with my girls and my son. And uh, against all the odds, and I was granted bail. But while I was praying, 
This prayer went into, turned into like the deepest, most meaningful sort of state of meditation that I can ever remember being in. I've always struggled meditating, tried and tried, struggle. And now, especially since I've been released and especially over the last 10 days, I pray and it feels good, you know. And um, I remember when I was locked up, I was praying and praying and it's like I say, it turned into this deep sort of meditative state where I was with all my kids. I was completely away from where I was. I mean, I was not there. It was so real and vivid that I could actually feel the fabric of my girl's dress as I embraced her. That's how real it was, you know. And I sort of come out of this state, prayer, you know, convinced that there was somebody there, you know, and that somebody was looking after us. And I was almost communicated with, like non-verbally, you know, and I was assured that everything was gonna be all right. You know, and it was, and it, and it will be, you know, and, um, yeah, I was granted bail and I went home and I prayed some more. And, um, and I think I'll pray every day. It feels good. I started reading the Bible. I read the Bible every morning and every night now. And I get a lot from it. Um, it's confusing sometimes. But um, I was given a, a blessing by a fella, the Geordie lad, moved over to America. I think he's like a preacher over there now. And um, Sent a blessing via Facebook, a little message, you know, a prayer. And I couldn't stop listening to it. Felt amazing, just listening to it. I could feel it. I could feel this fella's words. <coughs> and he said, go and get a Bible. Now this Bible, I've only ever had one Bible and I took it out of my granddad's house when I was cleaning his house out after he died. Um, <coughs> it was given to him in 1941 when he was nine, his first Holy Communion. The little stamp inside, you know, St. Trinity Church, awarded to Cecil Byers, 1941. And I was always fascinated with that thing, how old it was. But I'd never opened it. And he said, go and get a Bible and open it. So I thought, I know, and I've got one. Underneath them, all these books that I took from my granddad's under the sink. I went and got it. I opened the first hardback bit, as I'd always done. I read this bit where I'd always read, you know, fascinated by how old it was, pristine condition. So it's running up 80 year old now. And uh, he said, open it. I opened it. He said, it almost flopped open between Genesis 30 and 31. Bookmark fell out. It's where I must have been when my granddad was last reading. Granddad read the Bible a lot. Never went to church apart from that first time, you know. I think he went to church once or twice. Some mock up chapel thing when he was in the Korean War. And, um, a slip fell out, follow Jesus. I read it, follow Jesus, and it come out between Genesis 30 and 31. The first line that I read said, you have been blessed with a son named Dan. He was the only person ever to call us Dan. You know, no one really calls us Dan. And uh, it was powerful. I felt him there and then in the room. I, f I could feel him. And, uh, and all these things, signs, if you like, which I've probably dismissed for years through my own ignorance or just a failure to interpret, you know. Um, yeah, I felt it. I felt it big time. I could feel him in the room. And it felt to me like that book was always meant for me. There was, a, I was under, I'm certain actually that I was always meant to do what I'd done that day. And I was meant to open that book on the page that I opened it. And I was meant to pick it up right when my granddad was last reading. You know, and I'm uncertain of that fact. And since I've started expressing, you know, this relationship I'm building with God, you know, people are, people are always going to mock, you know, and stuff like that. And I can handle that. But um, for me, it's real, you know. And I think it's like recovery. I think it's like everything. You know, you have to be ready. You have to be, I don't know if it's maturity or what, but you have to be at a point in your life where you are ready. You have to be ready, you know. And I think it's this this readiness, this willing, willingness to accept higher power. And it's involuntary, you know. I never, ever set about to have this faith that I've got, you know what I mean? It happened to me, you know? And it does feel like it's meant to be. Yeah, but it's clearly working, big brother, because you're 
you're becoming clean now you're seeing the world differently you want to understand that like people can mock no matter if you turn to god or turn to the devil or whoever you want to turn to like it's all how you feel if you're doing things for the right reasons and you're not harming anyone then that's what i'm all about like good luck to that person yeah but like, i don't know people just move differently everybody's and everybody sees the world differently like it's just it's fucking life man like whatever's working for you and if you're in a better headspace your kids feel more love around you and you're giving more love you're, if you give more love you receive more love that's just how the universe works like, yeah of course it is but after then so what's happening now with your court case if you fight again if you fight him again in March that's does that put more uh, immediate prison does that put more stuff on your this fight's charges only, this fight's only going to happen if there's certain you know legal restrictions lifted which, like what you know there's a, there's a restrainer there which is actively as far as I know worked on being lifted the background by this other party can he take that is that is it the court that put that on or is it him it's a court order but it's applied for by the victim so it's the victim that can have it lifted so that's what we're waiting on and if that doesn't happen you know, neither will the fight be but um i'm confident it'll happen like i say what will be will be you know i'm not gonna force it if it happens it happens you know i'll turn up and i'll win but we'll see you know does that I, not make you question the first fight though that if you know that was there why did that not get lifted before the first fight? Well, it was the first thing I said. You know, I said, get this RO lifted. And I'm in. I was told by, you know, these lads that contacted us that don't you worry about that because I was of the, I was of the opinion that they were of, you know. He had to complain, was my understanding of this order. You know, he had to complain. The victim had to express, you know, whatever, panic alarm and distress or whatever it was. It wasn't the case, you know, it's an order of the court. So irrespective or irrelevant of what he says or doesn't say, you know, I've broken order of the court. Now, <clears throat> I don't want to say too much about the case because it's ongoing. But my mitigation is good. Um, there's an amount to a defence. But... Um, it will certainly take away a victim, you know, there won't be a victim anymore in the court's eyes. You know, and let's have it right, he's at one, is he? You know, so... We'll see how that pans out, mate, you know, but and again, you know, what will be, will be, you know. I'll leave it in the hands of the powers that be, and we'll see what happens. So going forward for the future, Danny boy, like you seem in a good headspace, it seems to yeah. be the perfect time to be doing this podcast as well. You're clean, you're, you're, you're seeing the world definitely, yes, you're battling, but who the fuck is not? Yeah. Where do you go from here then? Um, I've said this for a little while now. You know, once I think once I find myself, once I, once I get torn and once I really, really recognise and become clear about the person that I'm intended to be, because I know I don't think how, I'm, how God intended me to think. I don't behave how I was intended to behave. You know, I never have done for years. And uh, I think... Once, I've, once I'm certain of who I am, you know, I think once that happens, which could be a, a journey in itself, you know what I mean? Finding out exactly who I'm supposed to be. That could be, it could take a while, you know, could take years. But I think once I get there, and once I'm certain of who I am, because I'm not really certain of who I am, and I'm not exactly pleased with the person, you know, that I've been. So I think when that day comes, which it will come, you know, I think then, you know, and only then will I discover my, my own purpose. And I think, I do think I've got a purpose greater than myself. And I'm of the belief that, you know, I'm going to help so many people. I'm quite certain of that. I'm going to help a lot of people. I've got a passion for helping people. I've got an abundance of, you know, knowledge, if you like. You know, I'm a pretty smart fella. And, um, I think when that door opens, whenever that may be, I'll know, you know, it'll feel right internally. I'll have that feeling. It'll strike the chord. Until then, I don't know what it is. I've never felt, you know, like I've fulfilled my potential and my purpose, you know, and I think it's down to me not really knowing who I am, you know, through ignorance, not really knowing and not really embracing or recognizing, you know, the person They've probably always been there internally all along, but it's just been shrouded in so much negativity and, you know, this person that I'm supposed to be, 
you know, will surface before long. And um, I'm quite certain I'll have a real purpose. When that day comes, then I'll know my purpose. And I'm pretty certain that purpose will involve helping people. And, um, you know, I feel that when that door does open, I'll know what it is. Until then, I don't know. All I know is I have a purpose greater than myself. Yeah, that's a powerful thing. Yeah. So how can people get, if you get YouTube, if you get social media, how can people contact you? Yeah, I have. I've got, uh, well, I, I had my own channel. I've done it big boys. That Danny Big Boss was only created to, created it about just shy of two years ago, and I created it to defend myself online. I didn't even know it was a channel. I just thought it was, you know, like an account, you know. Then I seen this option wants to upload this video, so I uploaded it, and it was like a, it was a, it was a bit about Satan, you know. I think it's a powerful video. It's on my Danny Big Boss account, and I sort of uploaded this video, and then realised that it was actually a channel, you know, and I could upload videos to it and stuff. So I uploaded one or two and I've kept on going with that channel, but it was only last night I made my own channel. And uh, I want to put that big boss, I don't want to go back into that channel now, you know, because I've said a lot of things I didn't want to say. And I've been, you know, it's part of the person that I'm trying to leave behind that channel. He's like, so some of the things I've said and done on there, you know, it's part of the person that I'm wanting to put in, to, to leave mm -hmm. behind. So I've created a new channel. You can get access to it to my old account, Danny Big Boss, but it's the real Danny Christie. You know, and I'm, uh, I'll probably put a link up on my Facebook or something. You know, I'll try and get some some subscribers over there. I mean, I, I, wound, I wound up having over a thousand subscribers on Danny Big Boys just through, um, you know, I'd never asked for any of them. I think it was just through people, you know, interested in what I was saying and stuff. But this new account's definitely going to be a completely different course of action, a completely different path. And I want it to be about, you know, positivity, training, um, forgiveness, faith and recovery. You know, and I, Paul Paul Venice has got a, I owe a lot to Paul, like I've said, but uh, Paul's inspired us in, you know, a lot more than he, I think he recognises, you know. I really like Paul's journey and I respect his message, you know, and if I can, you know, if I can be a fraction, you know, do a fraction of the things that he does for people, you know, I'd be very, very happy with myself. Yeah, do you feel that old channel's a, a dark book in your life? Yeah. Uh, just ready to flip the chapter and move on and yeah. send me the link. I'll put your link, link to your new channel on this description. I think nice people one, watch bro. this interview, they'll see that you're actually a sound guy. Like, yeah. you, you maybe look at the videos and you're going to pass judgment, it's understand, but you went in a good headspace. Like mm -hmm. you say, you're full of drink and drugs and try yeah. to retaliate, try to respond. And it's not done in a professional manner because it just looks schoolboy stuff, but that yeah. other channel's got you in prison. It's got your sore face. It's, it's created a, a life of hell, but hmm. you created that channel. Absolutely. You created those videos, and it's a hard, it's a bitter pill to swallow. Is it meant? Wait a minute, was that? You, and everybody, because we're men, you want to respond, you want to retaliate, you want to defend your name, and rightly so. But there comes a stage when you go, it doesn't. You never win. Does because everybody's a loser out at all. Mm -hmm. Always, yeah. Because you look back and you think, fuck me, was what was I thinking? And you will come to that realization yeah. this year, brother, when you're going through yeah. those mass changes and <laughs> you start getting the nightmares, and you wake up and you'll think. But like you say, there's a fresh chapter here. It's a fresh year. You can change the year. You can change your channel. You can change your life. You can make better decisions. You can fucking go and achieve whatever you want to achieve. And that goes for anybody listening and watching. That like, you yeah. seriously can. And of course. it's just fucking. Take the bull by the horns, man, and, and go and create something different. Your life won't change unless you change everything that's around that. Mm -hmm. Friends, fucking jobs, whatever. And there's people say, "Oh, I can't leave my job. I've got bills." Understand it, but you can set you can set out new new goals and new, new fucking things to then create the changes to then plant the seed that they can then grow in three years' time, four years' time, like because the years fly in. Do. People don't <laughs> real, people don't think that people think that it's small steps where they want to achieve it in a week a month a year but the years fly in so imagine what you can do in three years five years if you actually start walking, plant the seeds now and start watering them for the life that you want to crave and change absolutely you yeah know what I mean brother but I do. would you like to finish up on anything um, one or two shout outs if I course, can man. if I can remember yeah, yeah. them all um, Paul Venice I've given a big shout out Shane Taylor you know, big Shane love Shane Shane the brilliant Great fella guy. Um, yeah I have, him, I have him on the phone a lot Paul yeah. fighting trolls for setting this interview up. Absolutely. Like Paul actually reached out to yeah. me, so yeah. he's doing his own thing with his own channel, so shout out to Paul. Absolutely, big shout out to Paul. Um, Billy and Joe have shouted shout them out. Shout out to Billy and Joe again. Um, Relentless Media is a fella, John. John, a good fella, um, really good fella. I want to shout out his Relentless Media um, YouTube channel. Um, John and Donna. I've already given a couple of shout outs, and uh, like I say, the Curric Estate, that'll always be there. I'll be back with you before long, boys. 
And um, no, that's about it. It's been an absolute pleasure. I said I wasn't going to do, you know, another podcast relating to these issues, but that's James English, isn't it? I yes, couldn't, couldn't Danny, listen, back. thoroughly yeah. enjoyed your story, Thank mate. you, brother. You're a good guy. God bless. And if the next fight comes out, I'll sure be watching, man. Um, Thank you, mate. God bless you. My man. Take care. Thank you, brother.